Have you ever wondered what a SAS raid against a Scottish prison housing some of the most violent criminals in the country would look like? One man's life was in serious jeopardy as he became a prisoner in his own workplace, held captive by rioting prisoners. This is the story of the Peterhead prison riot. In this video, we look at the background of the prison itself, the riot as it took place, and the equipment that the SAS use, Peterhead Prison, where there was a long-running violent war between inmates and staff, was an obvious location for an outbreak of violence amongst the prisoners. It was not called the Hate Factory for nothing. Peterhead Prison was built in 1888, and it was designed to hold 208 prisoners and to be Scotland's only convict prison for prisoners sentenced to hard labour. However, occupancy often averaged around 350, peaking at 455 prisoners in 1911. That's over double the capacity. Until the opening of the prison, Scottish convicts were transported to England to serve their sentences, but the first convicts were received in August of 1888. Peterhead supplied the labour force to work at Stirling Hill Quarry and in the Admiralty Yard attached to the prison. These convicts supported the work of a civilian labour force employed by the Admiralty to construct a harbour of refuge. Their role involved breaking up the rocks to be used in creating the breakwater. This was seriously hard labour in the often cold and miserable far northeast of Scotland. Years of violence and counter-violence had destroyed morale and any relationship between the detained and their detainers. It was a bit like a volcano and the pressure was building. It wasn't just one issue that triggered the events that were going to follow, it was like a collective attack of what the police often called going berserk. It was a cold morning on the 2nd of October 1987. Without warning, the prisoners started tearing the place apart. Remember that these prisoners were often sent to Peterhead as they had already been disruptive at other prisons. They seized control of D-Block and worked out their hatred of the prison and their jailers in an orgy of destruction. One of the leading figures in the violence was Sammy the Bear Rolston, an armed robber who had caused trouble in many Scottish and English prisons over the years. He was a man to be feared. Then there was Malcolm Legat. He was in for murder and he had also stabbed a prison guard in the leg and thrown hot fat over another. Then we have Douglas Mathewson. He was in prison for murdering a beauty queen. These men would become the ringleaders of the Peter Ed prison riot and they would be going face to face with the elite British SAS. This hardcore of convicts had a strong card to play as they resisted surrender. They had taken a prison officer hostage. They retreated into the area of a roof space of the old prison and created barricades and booby traps all around. They used burning bedding, bedpans and anything else they could find to keep the guards at bay. Their lair was like a medieval castle under siege, with a wall of debris and wreckage acting like a moat. All sorts of debris and slates were held down on prison officers who tried to get near them. The hostage was veteran prison officer Jackie Stewart, who at 56 years old at the time of the riot, was no doubt looking forward to a pleasant retirement in rural Aberdeenshire. The prison officer recalls the inmate trying to stab a fellow guard, which is when Jackie rushed to his aid. Despite managing to fight the knife off of him, various other prisoners had joined in, leaving Jackie in a very vulnerable position. He was now their prisoner. He still recalls the frightening ordeal that led to his life flashing before his very eyes. Jackie said, At that moment, I realised my life was in serious danger. When they took me up onto the roof, I realised that I'd been stabbed and my body was out of action. I think that's why I didn't feel anything. I was screaming out trying to make them stop, but I had no control. I felt as though I was floating above the ground. As the inmates forced Jackie up onto the roof of the prison, he discovered he'd actually been stabbed numerous times in his arms as well as in his kidney area. Being a prison officer at Peterhead was no easy task. Throughout his 125 year existence, Peterhead Prison had a reputation of one of Scotland's most notorious jails. Dubbed the Hate Factory, it housed some of the country's most violent offenders, including serial killer Peter Tobin and gangster Paul Ferris. At 35 years old, Jackie qualified as a new recruit into the prison service just in the nick of time, as back in the 1960s, 
that age was the maximum at which you were allowed to apply. His basic wage on starting was a mere £12 a week. To try and make a difference to his family income, Jackie would often work double shifts from 6 in the morning through to 9.30 at night which saw him finally bringing in a reasonable wage. It's from doing these back-to-back -back shifts that Jackie soon realized he was in no place for the faint-hearted. During his ordeal, Jackie was subjected to some of the worst incidences of rioting and assault. He had developed a reputation himself for discipline beyond expectations, and this led to his own nickname of Hess, and to the saying, don't mess with Hess. But no doubt the prisoners now thought they would be getting even with Jackie. Jackie was paraded on the roof at Peterhead Prison. He had lighter fuel stuffed into his pockets and prisoners threatened to set him alight. Prisoner Malcolm Leggett was the one who held Jackie on the roof for a period of five days. In this time, he endured beatings as he was manhandled, punched, kicked and hit with broken furniture. Jackie said, Leggett removed my bootlaces and threatened to tie my hands with them. I was no longer in my uniform as I was forced to wear prisoner's clothes. I assured him I wasn't going to be any trouble and I think perhaps that's what saved my life. Jackie described the pain he was in. He says the stabbings, the beatings, combined with a lack of sleep, left me feeling really stressed, weak and disorientated. There was another complication though. Jackie only had one kidney and he needed daily medical attention and drugs. The authorities had to get him to safety and they had to do it urgently. Scottish politicians and the men at the top of the Scottish prison service were under pressure from public opinion to bring the outrage to an end and to ensure there were no deaths. They turned to London and a Prime Minister who was not the type to pussyfoot around. Margaret Thatcher, Malcolm Rifkin and Douglas Hurd gave the go-ahead for the SAS to intervene. Sending in UK special forces to deal with a domestic criminal situation would set a dangerous precedent and several politicians were against it. At first, an SAS officer was sent to Peterhead in a purely advisory role. As the stalemate ensued at the prison, the call was eventually put out to send in the SAS to rescue Jackie Stewart. Twenty men from the on-call anti-terrorism team travelled from Hereford, their SAS headquarters. Then they flew from RAF Lynham in a C-130 up to Aberdeen. Once they arrived, they were then driven under police escort to Peterhead Prison, where they set up ready for the assault. The SES assault teams were kitted out in body armour, fireproof coveralls, respirators, plus because the assault had been planned for a stealthy approach, they wore trainers instead of the more commonly worn army boots. Their primary weapon was a wooden baton, but they also carried 9mm Brownings as backups. Each team also carried flashbangs and tear gas canisters. And this is one of the hickory sticks used during the riot. In the right hands, this was a ferocious weapon. The plan was to hit the prison from all sides simultaneously, causing mass panic and confusion amongst the prisoners. While a rescue team entered from the roof, which is where the hostage was located, and they would enter via a hole the prisoners had made themselves. At 5am, six SES men snuck across the prison roof. At that moment, on each of the three floors of D-Wing, an SAS team blew their way in with explosives, hurling in CS gas and stun grenades before rushing in to clear the cells. Above them, the six-man rescue team threw stun grenades and CSS grenades through the hole in the roof. Then they quickly jumped down into the rafters and secured the hostage, who was in shock, but he was unharmed. The prisoners had been too stunned by the force and the speed of the SAS assault to put up any sort of resistance. In a short time, less than six minutes, the prison authorities came in and reclaimed the building and took charge of the inmates, while the SAS melted away into the shadows. Now it appears the SAS had been pretty heavy-handed in the execution of their mission, 
and multiple court cases followed the events at Peterhead Prison. The court report reads as follows. An SAS soldier who took part in an operation to end a jail siege in which two prison officers were held hostage denied setting out to teach the inmates a lesson. The soldier, identified only as Soldier T, said it was not true that his attitude was whatever you do with the prison warders, you don't make a monkey of the SAS. He was being cross-examined by Lionel Datchus QC on the third day of a £30,000 damages claim by prisoner John Devine. Mr Devine claims that he was illegally and severely beaten by the SAS soldiers when they ended the siege at Peterhead Prison in October 1987. Soldier T told the court he was trained to deal with counter-terrorism incidents and in particular the release of hostages. When they were given the order to go, they dropped in two flashbangs through the hatch. Soldier T entered first. It was dark inside but he had a torch. He says, as I entered the attic space, I came across the prison warder. I moved towards him and checked he was okay and passed him to the man behind me. Almost instantly, he saw one of the prisoners running towards him, apparently with a knife. He goes on to say, I moved towards him and struck his forearm with my baton. I then struck up towards his face. The first blow was to disarm him and the second was to enable me to move closer, to grab him and to put him off balance. He was then turned around and pushed towards what I thought was a wall but there was actually a hole in the floor. Soldier T denied striking the prisoner about the head at any other stage, and he said the prisoner was not thrown 12 feet from the attic to the gallery below deliberately. The soldier also denied saying or hearing his colleague say to the prisoner, you're going for a spin now, pal. Later, prison nursing officer Alistair Much told the court that he had found 11 wounds on Devine's head at the end of the siege. So there we have it, the infamous Peterhead prison siege. What do you think? Did the SAS have every reason to be heavy-handed? I'd love to hear your thoughts, and don't forget to like the video, leave me a comment and subscribe to the channel. We've got lots more content coming your way. Until next time.